Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. You know, it was just the other day that someone sent me an email uh, with the subject line uh, that read like this, you know you're having a bad day when, dot, dot, dot. And um, how many of you here have ever gotten an email like that before? They're kind of, they're kind of joke emails. And, um, you know, I got one the other day. I don't know why exactly it is, but it seems like these kind of emails uh, show up in our inboxes uh, usually when we're having a day just like that, a bad day. I don't know why it is. Um, but I got one, and, you know, I thought it might be fun if I shared a little bit of it with you. Um, they're kind of the tell tale signs of... Of, of what happens when you have a bad day. And, and so I'm going to share a few of them with you. But before I do, turn to the person next to you and just tell them your day is about to get better. Just tell them that. A little bit better, yeah. And so these are some of the signs that you're having a bad day. You know, the first one is you know you're having a bad day when you have to hitchhike to the bank in order to make a car payment. Okay, that's a bad day. Uh, You know you're having a bad day when the suggestion box at work starts ticking, and that's a bad day. You know you're having a bad day when people send your wife sympathy cards on your anniversary. (laughs) And you know you're having a bad day when the pest exterminator crawls under your house and never comes back out. You know you're having a bad day when your children's school calls to tell you that they have surrendered. And you know you're having a bad day when your wife takes the dog on vacation and leaves you at the kennel. You know you're having a bad day when your plants do far better when you don't talk to them. And uh, you know you're having a bad day when your wife wraps your lunch in a road map. That's a bad day. You know you're having a bad day when you call the suicide prevention line and they put you on hold. And then maybe the last one, you know you're having a bad day when the birds that are singing outside your window are vultures. <laughs> so, so those are some of the most common telltale signs that you are indeed having a very mean and nasty, ugly, bad day. And as much as we hate them, we do, we hate them, as much as we try and uh, our very best to, to, to stay a million miles away from them, the reality is, is they are all part and parcel of what it means to be human. And that inevitably, uh, sometime or another, uh, all of us are going to have one of those. We're going to have a bad day. And so because of it, the question that we should ask ourselves is never, it's never, are they coming But rather, the question we ought to ask ourselves is, what might my response be when they do? How should I respond when I or those around me are facing a bad day? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And those of you who've been with us through our 40 Day of Care campaign, you'll know that we've been looking at what the Bible calls uh, the one another's of the Christian faith. And they're all through the New Testament. Um, one another. So far, we've, we've touched on six of them. We've talked about loving one another, accepting one another. We talked about building one another up, carrying one another's burdens. We talked about forgiving one another. Pastor Sheldon last Sunday preached a message on serving one another. And this morning, what I'd like to do is wrap this series up by looking at the last and final one another in it. And it's this one right here, encourage one another. Let's say that together, encourage one another. Let's say it again, encourage one another. And because really when you get right down to it, this right here is what we ought to be doing whenever we come across a person who is having a very dark and difficult day. Because we're all going to have them. There's people around us right now who are having them. And so uh, what we should do is we ought to step into that person's space and pour in as much strength and encouragement as we possibly can. And so that's what we're going to dive into this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you, 
Um, either turn them on or, tr- or turn them to uh, Hebrews uh, 10, verse uh, 22. Hebrews 10, verse 22. And I'm going to be reading out the, uh, of the New Living Translation, the uh, NLT. Uh, for those of you who have a Bible app and have access to a variety of versions. But let's pick it up here in uh, Hebrews 10, verse 22. It says, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not let, neglect the meeting together of some, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And so as you can see here um, in this series of verses, there is what I would call a whole bunch of lettuce. And of course, when I say lettuce, I'm not talking about the green kind that you put in a salad and you eat. But rather, I'm talking about the verbal kind that God calls every one of us to embrace and walk in. And of course, you see it here. We read it. It says, let us go right into the presence of God with a sincere heart, trusting Him. And then it says here, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. And then it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And then it says, and let us not neglect the meeting of one another together. It's let us, let us, let us, let us. And you know, it's the third one here in this list that I want to focus in on this morning. And that is the one that says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. We can go to the next slide. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let's say this word together, motivate. You know, this word motivate in the Greek literally means to sharpen, to stimulate, to provoke, to stir up. In fact, uh, in, in, in many uh, other versions of Scripture, this word is translated as encourage. It says, let us think of ways to encourage one another in acts of love and good works. And, um, and so uh, what I'd like to do is unpack this whole area of encouraging one another a little bit for you this morning, uh, because I think that all of us could probably um, do it a little bit more, be a little bit more proficient when it comes to encouraging one another. I know I sure could. I, I know I could encourage other people more, and I know I, I could sure use some encouragement from other people more, and so I want to just share with you some ways that we can do just that, be more encouraging, and you know, the first thing I see here is, is by being intentional. We want to be intentional. In other words, oftentimes encouragement is something that we need to be deliberate about doing. Deliberate. Another word might be calculated about doing. Most of us, that's just the way we're wired. Now, I know that there are some people, some of us, who have what the Bible calls the gift of encouragement. It's a spiritual gift. And and, and some people are just born with it. They're born encouragers. How many of you ever met somebody like that? Yeah, they just ooze encouragement. And that's because they have the gift. Paul talks about it in Romans 12, 7. He says, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. And so what that is telling us is that there are some people who have this wonderful, glorious gift of encouragement, and because of it, it comes naturally to them. It, 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 It just flows out of them. How many have ever met a person like that? I, I can think of a few people right now who, who are like that. They're like gushing fountains of encouragement. And thank God for them. We need more of them. I mean, if you go up to them and pull a chicken little, and how many know what a chicken little is? That's when you think your sky is falling. Ba-bop. Right? You go up to a person like that, 
telling them the sky is falling, they'll look at you and they, they, they might say, well, you know, your sky might indeed be falling, but what an awesome, wondrous sky it is. It's got such beautiful sunrises and sunsets and starry nights. You know, they're so positive and, and so encouraging. They, they, it just oozes out of them. There are people like that, uh, but not all of us are that way. I know I'm not that way. And for those of us who aren't wired that way, those of us who don't have the gift of encouragement, what it means is we just can't go around looking like Eeyore all the time, right? Discouraging everyone. Oh, I don't have the gift of encouragement. And so get away from me. That's not how, how we're to be. Whether you have the gift or not, we need to be encouraging. And for those of us who don't have the gift, it means we have to work a little bit harder. And working harder means being more intentional and deliberate. And that's exactly what uh, the writer says here. Look at it. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another. Think of ways. We need to be thinking of ways. One translation says, let's consider ways to encourage one another. Another one says, let's look out for ways to be encouraging. And yet another one says, let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging each other. In other words, for most of us, encouragement doesn't come naturally. And so we need to be deliberate and thoughtful in doing it. Maybe thinking more. Thinking and planning just who we might encourage today. And then what we might say and do to see that it happens. And you know, one simple way we could become better at this, and I'm suggesting this to myself as well, is that maybe every morning, this is kind of a, some homework I want to give you, maybe every morning uh, in this whole next month, before we head off to work or school, maybe we could take some time to write the name of one person that we're going to encourage that day. Wouldn't that be kind of neat? You know, before we head out the door, we'll write the name of one person and, and what we're going to do to encourage them. It might be a co-worker or a boss or an employee. It could be a friend or a family member. It might be a, your spouse, one of your children. Why? It could even be your, your, your pastor. How many know pastors need encouragement every once in a while? Yeah. Amen. They do. And, 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 and so maybe, maybe a, some, 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 some great homework for all of us is to start our morning intentionally thinking about who am I going to encourage and, and strengthen today. It's called being more thoughtful when it comes to the gift of encouragement. So that's the first thing I see here. Is, uh, is being intentional. You know, the second thing I see here is, is we need to be purposeful. Let's say this word together, purposeful, purposeful. In other words, we, we need to make sure that our encouragement is, is, is on purpose, that our encouragement always has a clear mission and, and destination attached to it. You know, that we don't just go around encouraging people just for the sake of stroking their egos, right? Or making them feel better about themselves, right? That you're so awesome, you're so wonderful, you're so brilliant and magnificent and gifted that by the time we are, are finished with them, their head is so big they can't even get out the door. That's not what the, the gift of encouragement is for. That's not what true biblical encouragement is all about. It's never just to stroke someone's ego or puff them up, but rather it always has a very clear purpose and destination hooked up to it. And you might wonder, well, what is that destination? You see it here in our verse. Let's think of ways to motivate one another to where are we headed? Acts of love and good works. That's our destination. One translation says, let's consider ways to inspire each other to greater love and righteous deeds. In other words, one of the main reasons why we are called to strengthen and encourage one another is so that we can provoke 
and, and motivate and spur, spur one another on to do what? More loving and caring and grander deeds for God and his kingdom. That's the whole purpose of encouragement, right? That we're encouraging to do grander deeds. We're encouraging so people can step into their destiny. We're encouraging people to get closer to to Christ and his will and purpose for their lives. That's what encouragement is all about. And, and you know, you see this principle. It comes out so powerfully uh, in a story in the Old Testament. story by the name of Gideon. Many of you are familiar with it. Uh, But uh, the nation of Israel has been conquered, enslaved by their arch enemy known as the Midianites. Things are so bad. You talk about bad days. Things have gotten so bad that the only way the Israelites can uh, even harvest their field and make bread uh, was to do it at night when everyone was asleep. And so one night Gideon is doing just that. He's threshing wheat in a wine press and suddenly he has a life-changing encounter with God. And you see it here in Judges 6 verse 11. It says, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And I'm sure that as soon as Gideon heard those words, he must have thought, who? Mighty hero? Sorry, you you know, angel, I mean, you got the wrong address. You you must be thinking of the other Gideon, four wine presses down. Because Gideon, he was the furthest thing from a mighty hero, and he even says it himself in this story. He turns to the angel and he says, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm the least of the least. I'm the least person in my family. My family is the least family in my tribe. And my tribe is the least tribe in all of Israel. And that's how Gideon saw himself. He was the least of the least of the least of the least. And the furthest thing from his mind was being a mighty hero. Right? That was the furthest thing. And you know, just uh, for the record, this word mighty hero here literally means someone with virtue, valor, substance, and strength. And that was the word that the angel delivered to Gideon there in the wine press. And I'm telling you, what a word it was. You talk about a word of encouragement spoken to this discouraged Gideon straight from the very lips of God himself. And yet as wonderful and as uplifting as this word was, it came with a very clear and specific purpose attached to it. And you see it here a few verses later. It says, Then the Lord turned to him, Gideon, and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. In other words, the whole reason why God gave Gideon such a powerful word of encouragement was for so that he he would step in to the destiny and purpose God had for his life. That's what encouragement is all about. It's exactly what the writer of Hebrews told us, that he was encouraged for what? For acts of love and good works, mighty deeds to be done in the name of God. That's why God encouraged him. I mean, can you imagine if Gideon, what would have happened if he, all he had done is received that word of encouragement without any mission or, 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 or purpose attached to it? Gideon, you are a mighty man of valor, a mighty hero. He would have went home, right? Walked through the door and told his wife, I had an encounter with God. He called me a mighty hero, a mighty man of valor. And from now on, dear, whenever I come home and walk through this door, I want the children to blow the trumpets. And I want you to say, hail, hail, the mighty hero is home. How many of you know that wouldn't have went over well? I know it because I tried it. I asked Clarice to do that a while back. And she sent me right back out the door and told me to come back in with a much smaller head. (laughs) 
A smaller head. That's not what words of divine encouragement are for. They're not given to stroke our egos. They're not given to make us just make us feel better about ourselves. They're not given for that. The reason why God encourages us and the reason why we are to encourage one another is to help people around us step into the plan and purposes and destiny of God for their life. That's what encouragement is all about. Amen? And so the way I like to say it is like this. Encouragement with no direction produces entitlement and self-absorption. Absorption. That's a funny word. How many have ever met a person who was entitled and self-absorbed? Don't look at the person next to you. Just straight ahead. (laughs) Some say that's what's happening in the world today. People are are so self-absorbed. They're so entitled. They're so entitled. Oftentimes, we we older folks say that about younger people, right? The younger generation today, they seem so entitled. And um, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I do know that there are some young and old who are entitled. But I'll tell you, if, if you don't want an entitled child, you know, one way to do it is you don't just pet them on the head. You are great. You're so awesome. You're so gifted. You're so wonderful. You got it in you. Now, do you want a sandwich and go downstairs and play some video games? That's not why you encourage young people or any people. You encourage them for bigger things. And so this is the way I like to say it, is encouragement with divine direction produces selflessness and righteous deeds. That's what encouragement is all about. Encouraging one another to do greater and grander things for God. And so parents, uh, we don't want to just speak words of comfort and encouragement over our children and leave it at that. We want to speak words that will help them step into all that God has called them to do. That's how it works. And so what does that mean? Rather than saying to your child, I really see the gift of kindness and compassion in you and leave it at that. Maybe it would be better to say, you know, I really see that gift of kindness working in you. And you know, I really believe that God wants you to use that gift. uh, Even in school, maybe in your class by encouraging and And reaching out to hurting and lonely people. See, it's encouragement with a destination. And that's what we've been called to do. And I'll tell you, ladies, this this is absolutely critical uh, for us guys, right? Uh, Because guys need encouragement. I mean, we all need encouragement, but men need encouragement more than anyone else. Because we have these things called fragile egos, right? And I'm not saying we need our egos stroked, but we need our egos built up in a healthy way. We all need that so we can do what God has called us to do. And, and, and so I would encourage you, uh, wives, to, to, to speak words of encouragement to your husband, not so that he'd just get a fat head, but that he'll do what God has called him to do. You say, you're really good at this, honey. And so I can see you doing that. That you are really gifted here, I can see you excelling there. You see, it's, an atta- it's attaching encouragement to purpose. And I would, I, I would encourage all of us to do that a little bit more. Right? I mean, you know, think about who we will encourage and then what we will encourage them about. And where will we send them with our encouragement. And so that's the first thing. Uh, I see when it comes to encouragement is, is, is to be intentional in doing it. The second thing is, is to be purposeful when giving it. And then the last thing is to be relational. Relational. That all encouragement takes place in the context of relationship and deeper connection. And maybe that's why some of us have gone through a, a, a drought season of encouragement. Maybe, maybe that's why some of us have been struggling with higher levels of discouragement. Because maybe we haven't been connected the way we should. Encouragement has everything to do with relationship. And you see that here in verse 25. It says, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. 
You know, the first thing I want to say about this verse here is what I call the ever-increasing need all of us will have when it comes to this whole area of encouragement. The need will get greater. Now, you might be asking, why do you say that? Well, I say that because of what this verse says. It says, encourage one another, especially now. Why now? Because the day of his return is drawing near. In other words, what the writer is saying is as we get closer and closer to what the Bible calls the last days, to, 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 to the day of Christ's return, as we get closer and closer to that, the larger and more frequent doses of encouragement we are going to need. You might say, well, why is that? Well, the reason why is if you know anything about what the Bible says in regards to the last days, you're going to know that it's not going to get brighter, it's going to get darker. It's going to get more difficult. The closer we get to the end of the age, the more difficult it's going to be to navigate many things, and you already see it today. You know, Paul talked about it in 2 Timothy 3.1. He said, but know this, he's writing to his apprentice, Timothy, that in the last days, perilous times will come. It's like Paul was able to look into the future, and, and as he did, he took out his pen and he began to write about it. He said, there are perilous times coming, dangerous, dark times are coming. And then he begins to describe them, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These are the signs of the last days. It's going to get tougher. It's going to get darker. And the closer we get to them, what does the writer say? Well, we need to step into the place of encouragement all the more. We need to be hooked up relationally all the more so that we can receive the strength and courage we need to face these things. Because perilous times are upon us. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You're already there right now. Some of you are already going through some very dark and difficult things right now. Some of you are facing some, some difficult things financially. Some of you have, have had a business that you launched and then it failed. Uh, some of you ha have a career that isn't working. Some of you, your marriage is floundering. It's about to hit the rocks. Some of you, your relationships are broken and they're creating all kinds of pain. Some of you are wrestling with illness and, and, and others with loss that is overtaking you, trying to cripple you. It's called dark and perilous times. And here the writer tells us exactly what we need to do, not only what we need to do, where we need to go when we find ourselves in those very places. We read it. It says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. In other words, the way we stay comforted and encouraged and strengthened and alive through the many dark and difficult seasons we go through in life, I want you to hear me, it's by staying connected and in relationship with one another. The writer says, let's not neglect it. You know, this word neglect means to uh, abandon, to forget, to leave behind. I wonder how many of us here this morning have just forgotten about the life-giving flow of relationships in our lives. Maybe we've just gotten too busy, right? Maybe our calendar has just gotten too full doing this thing and that thing. Maybe we have just uh, uh, left behind some of the relationships that used to feed us and, and supply us with courage and strength we needed to face what's in front of us. We never want to find ourselves in a place like that where we forget and leave the very things that are going to pour fresh strength and courage into us. Encouragement means to put courage in. 
And the only way we can face some of the things that we're going through in this world is a fresh dose of courage. And many times that courage is going to come from the people around us. It's hard to stay encouraged when you're disconnected and doing life alone. It's hard. It's hard to stay motivated when you're isolated and detached from other people. It's hard. It's hard to stay positive and uplifted and filled with strength when all you're doing is sitting at home on the couch watching reruns of the Game of Thrones. That's hard. I I would not recommend that. Get out. Join a club. Get Get into something. That's no way to find encouragement because one of the ways God has designed us is that we get our courage and strength from those around us. And you know, you see this so powerfully in the life of Paul. He's writing, he says, we, when we arrived in Macedonia, there was no rest for us. We face conflict from every direction, battles on the outside, fear on the inside. You talk about a bad day. Paul is having one in spades. No rest, conflict coming at us from every direction. Battles on the outside, fears on the inside. And yet, just look at the way in which God chose to help him. I want you to think about this. Paul is facing a very difficult season in his life. He is needing to be encouraged. And look at how it came in the very next verse. But God, let's say that together. But God. Let's say it again. But God. But God who encourages those who are discouraged. Isn't that a wonderful promise? God will encourage me. And he will. But how does he do it? God who encourages those who are discouraged encouraged us by the arrival of who? Titus. Titus was a dear friend of Paul's. And so here Paul is right in the trenches, he's right in the battlefield, he's feeling discouraged and, 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 and demotivated, the, the courage flowing right out of him, and he prays, God, I need to be encouraged. And rather than sending an angel from heaven, who does God send but his dear friend Titus? It's called the strength, the beauty of connection and relationship, and, and, and that's how God gets his courage to us. The relationships are the conduits and channels God uses to pour fresh strength and encouragement into us. And so I want to ask you, how is your relational life doing? How are you doing? Right? I want to encourage you to to make a commitment to get into some healthy relationships And then once you're in them, stay in them. Stay in them. Don't neglect them. Because that's where all the strength and life come from. Now, you might wonder, well, how do you do that? Well, one way we do it around here is through our connect groups. I mean, it's hard to get into deep relationships on a Sunday. It's hard. We don't have a lot of time. And so what we do, we have connect groups that meet every night of the week. And all different topics, all different kinds of connect groups. We have a, if you want to know more about our connect groups, we have a connect group board right in the foyer. Or you can go on our website, just look at all the different groups that we are offering. Some of them have closed, but many of them are still open. I would encourage you to, uh, uh, to be part of that. You know, another way to get connected in the church is find a place of service. Now, that's a great way to build bridges of relationship. Find a, a ministry that you can serve in. And you know, when you came in this morning, you, you, you saw one of these on your seat, volunteer opportunities, and, and we have a few. Nursery, our nursery ministry needs five volunteers. And, and, and what a fantastic way to get to know some people in a deeper way, just by, by signing up and serving in an area of ministry. You join a team. and we, Our greeters ministry needs 10 more greeters to do what we need to do. And I would encourage you, uh, to, if you're not serving in an area of ministry, fill one of these out and put it in the offering plate as it goes by. Because that's just one more tether of relationship that will help feed us and keep us. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Stay in relationship. You know, I want to close this morning 
by looking at um, the first led us that we talked about or we read this morning. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty conscience have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. What a glorious verse. In this, in this one verse is what we call the, the message of the gospel. Right? That we can go right into the presence of God. One translation says to boldly come into God's presence. Think about it. How do unholy, unrighteous beings like us How can we ever stand in the presence of a holy God? How can we boldly go into God's presence? How can that ever be? Well, I know what religion says. Religion says, well, you get there by working harder, being better, doing better deeds, thinking better thoughts, being a better person. And maybe if you're good enough, then you can stand in the presence of God and He will accept you. That is the message of religion. And yet the message of the Bible is clear. It says even our best is not good enough. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. Why? Because God is so holy. He's so righteous that we can never earn the right to stand in His presence. And yet what makes this verse so glorious is there's the invitation. We can go right into the presence of God. How can that be? We can trust Him. How can that be? We can have our guilty conscience cleansed. How can that be? Well, the reason why is because it's been sprinkled with Christ's blood. That's why. Jesus did what we couldn't do. And what we, what we couldn't do is live a, a perfect, sinless life. Jesus did all that for us. And all we have to do is receive what He's done. The way I like to say it is religion says do. Do more, do more, do more, do more. Christianity says done. It is all done for us. And all we have to do is accept it as a free gift. Our, 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 our hearts cleansed from sin. The guilt washed away. The shame broken from our lives. Why? Because of all that Jesus has done for us. That is the glorious message of the gospel. And so, you know, maybe you're here today and you've never done that. Maybe you've never stepped into the presence of God receiving the gift of salvation through Christ. And so this morning, what I'd like us to do is we're going to pray. And so I want us all to stand. And Maybe you're here, you've never done that. You've never opened your life up and, and, and said, Jesus, come in, cleanse me, wash me. Make me a a son, a daughter of yours. And so we're going to pray this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. How many here would say, you know, Pastor Dave, I, I want to do that this morning. I want to take a formal step towards Christ. Invite Him into my life. And I want to ask Him to be my leader and my Lord, cleansing me from all my sins with our head bowed and eyes closed. How many here would lift your hand and say, you know, Pastor Dave, pray for me. I want to do that. Pray for me. Just lift your hand this morning. You want prayer for that. Thank you for that hand. Is there anybody? That hand. Anybody else? Don't don't be shy. Just lift your hand. You're you're accepting Christ. That hand there. Anybody else? This is a holy moment where people come into relationship with a holy, all holy, but all loving God. And so, Father, you see these hands, you see these hearts. I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would step right into them right now. Cleanse them. Release them of shame and guilt as they surrender to you make you leader and Lord and Father we thank you for that in Jesus name and everyone said Amen you know if you lifted your hands this morning 
I would encourage you at the end of the service, we have what we call a yes table. And we call it a yes table because you're saying yes to Jesus. I would encourage you to visit our yes table before you leave today. We'd love to pray with you, give you some material in your walk with Christ. But you know, some of us, and I don't want to take a long time, but some of us need a fresh dose of encouragement in our lives today. And so I want you to hold your hands out like this. Because I know that some of us here this morning, we're walking through some very difficult things. Some of us have, have, have been broadsided because of things that have happened in our family and in our relationships. I really feel that. It's just, it's just like been a sudden, a s- sudden difficult thing. And you're at the end of your road. And so, Father, I pray that you would pour a fresh dose of encouragement upon all of us. Father, that you would lift us up. Father, fill us with greater strength and courage. And Father, I speak to weary hearts right now. And I pray that they would be filled with you. I speak to the spirit of discouragement that is, is, is abiding on people's minds and their marriages and their families. And I break that thing off in Jesus' name. And Father, right now we ask that the fullness of your grace might rest upon us. That we can be the army, the salt, the light that you've called us to be. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's give the Lord a clap offering. Amen. Amen.